production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, a painter who embraces the moment. I want everybody to know that I love everyone. I don't care where you're from, what you do. A dance that explores black identity. A percussion world premiere. What I came to realize is that I separated myself from music. And so being back on the stage, I'm actually relearning how to appreciate what it is I do. And a little bit of salty fun. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, welcome to Broad and High. I'm your host, Kate Quickle. Artists all around the world have been using the pandemic as an inspiration for their work. And there's one West African artist living right here in Columbus who uses images of the coronavirus itself to express his belief that every moment of life is truly sacred. He's an artist, a curator, and a mentor for young African American artists. Meet Tali Bamazi. My name is Dali and uh, from Togo, West Africa. Uh, I get here in 1995 uh, from West Africa. Uh, I was invited to have a show in Philadelphia. And so I just started going to school and then later on went to New York Academy, graduate. And then uh, later on I decided to come to Ohio, my ex-wife and I. So we decided to search. And so when, when I search, I find out that Ohio, and especially in Columbus, they have a major world-renowned collectors. And I was like, wow, sweetheart, that's where we're going. <laughs> I was very surrealist also at that time. You know, I kind of changed as I came over there, kind of find my way. I kind of master all style now, so going abstract, surrealism, realism. And so I can understand all cultures, you know, I can answer any questions in any style. My role is to document the moment. And that's what I'm doing. You see the symbol of a coronavirus, I begin to introduce them. The first one was uh, the other one there, which is uh, death. There's no one that will not die. If you're born, you're gonna die. Anything that's being created will spoil. If you understand that rule, you will live longer and peaceful. When you look at them, as dark they are, they're beautiful. As dark they are, you see the beauty in. So in this moment right now, I appreciate it. So every single, Every spot or every second, a second that I leave, for me is a grateful time. So I use that wisely. I, I present life with eggs. Anytime you see eggs um, uh, in my in my painting, it's mean life. And the calabash, I always put a calabash inside my work because. Uh, this is uh, the symbol of life, because that's, that thing for me, that's the beginning of a, a conscience of a human being. Anywhere you go, you will see the calabash. It just is not effect is Africa. So we use that daily, just to drink our wine. Daily we have that. The, the, the queen used to be the Jews inside. You know, they, it's a different way that this is served in Africa. So it's beautiful, it's kind of, it's earthy, you know, it's, 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 it's beautiful when you look at it. I'm a human. And as long as I will live, I'll be human. I don't care who you are, 
when I met you, when I met anyone, I want us to have experience of human being. That we don't have that no more. We let that go. I want everybody to know that I love everyone. I don't care where you're from, what you do. Bad, good, I love you. If we can love each other, what else can you give someone beside the love? Tali Bamazi had a recent show at Otterbein University Museum and Gallery. Log on to columbusmakesart.com to find more upcoming shows. Our next segment explores identity by infusing humor into dance. Meet Dominic Moore Dunson, a dancer and choreographer who created the Black Card Project up in Cleveland. It all started with a longing to play English soccer. Take a look. In sixth grade, Miller South, I'm sitting with the seven other black boys in my grade at the time, and we're all sitting at the same lunchroom table. And we're talking about what we wanted to be when we grew up. And one of them says, I want to be in the NBA, I want to play like LeBron. And the other ones were, I want to be in the NFL, I want to be like Michael Vick. When it was my turn to say something, I said, well, I want to dance in Paris or play professional soccer in England. And there was this deafening silence that went over the table. And one of my friends looks at me and says, bruh, that ain't black. And all the kids started laughing. There's this overarching feeling that like, well, if, you know, if I don't know this about the black culture, if I don't know this kind of music, I'm not black enough. Um, if I don't like this kind of food, I'm not black enough. You know, sometimes I feel like I was supposed to learn how to be black somewhere. And, but nobody, there's no program to learn how to be black. And I kind of sat for a while and I was like, what if there was a school? What if there was a school where you like, someone learned how to be black? And that's where it started. And I was like, what if there's this kind of weird, interesting character who's kind of like, me, but like a different version of me in my head. And what if, you know, he kind of went through all these classes and it kind of felt like a really weird version of The Wizard of Oz? Because you have a single character who runs into all these different characters and learns all this stuff. So it's kind of like the structure that we used. Kevin Parker, when I asked him to collaborate on the show, I didn't know really what the show was yet. I was talking to him, we went out to an Applebee's and we sat down and I was like, so I have this idea. I kind of want to talk to you about like what it means to be black. And we started just kind of like joking and laughing about all of these things that we knew about. So we're at Firestone High School, which is my alma mater. I graduated from Firestone in 2008. It's hard to talk about how important it is to me because this moment is full circle. At 14 years old, I was learning the foundations of what it meant to be a creator. At the same time, I was dealing with all these internal struggles of, well, can I dance? Should I be dancing? Can I play soccer? Should I be playing soccer? But coming into this place was like a very safe space for me to explore who I really, really knew I was as an artist at a such a young age. And to be, you know, 16 years later, bringing my 90 minute work, a very large work for somebody around my age, and knowing that wow, just a couple hundred feet that way while I was on stage, I started this process. I would say I've never really seen a show quite like this. This was completely different. The fact that it only had two people in it doing an entire story was like enough at that to set it aside from most things I've seen. I guess I never really thought about a black card, like ever having a black card and like realizing that like it is a thing like, oh, like, there are things that I don't know about that like, like happen within my community. I would say the slight stereotypicalness of it, it was pretty funny. Like the, the little gangster walk and the stereotypical clothing, it was, it, it was pretty funny. <laughs> the problem with humor is it's actually the hardest thing to do on stage. Because um, you have to think about your own biases as what you think is funny versus what other people think is funny. So that's one of the first barriers. Inside of this conversation, we wanted to use humor because we wanted to pull people into our world and making people laugh always does that. You want to pull people into the show before you hit them with the really hard topics. We couldn't start the show with the history section because it's, it's too raw and it feels too close to home. So you invite people in by making things funny, by making them fun, playing their favorite music, and all of a sudden they're willing to go on the journey with you no matter where you take them. 
And we realized that's what we needed to do because like I've seen a lot of modern dance shows and often when you talk about race, the piece is very heavy. And a lot of times you'll see people who are singing forward start to lean back and disengage because it feels like too much for them. So we were like, okay, well, what if we did the opposite? What if over time we got them to lean forward and then they would stay there? So it's also taking that idea of like, we have these characters who are these stereotypes, but what if we broke the stereotype and made you learn something about them that changed you a little bit? C.T. Payne, who's the thug, he doesn't think he's funny. He's very, very serious. But as you saw on the show today, the kids will laugh as soon as they see him. The part that was really difficult actually was making sure every character had integrity and it wasn't my emotional feelings about that character that came out because me and Kevin talked about we can't be hypocrites. We can't say there's no one way to be black and then say, well, the way the thug's doing it is wrong. And I knew I wanted to do something that had to do with black history, but I didn't know what. So I was just going through clips and things like that. And one day I had this dream that I was running. And I was just like, you know, there's a slave master running me, there was the dog happening and all this stuff. And then I had another dream about being in the Jim Crow South and what that felt like. And then I had another dream right after that that was like the 60s Black Panther movement. And then another dream that was kind of being this Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice type character. So the section is actually literally a dream I had. All you can really hear is whippings and getting hit with batons and all of that. And I would say that that kind of is really reflectful on our history. I feel like it was, that was probably the part that made it most impactful, was just like the way they drawn in the audio with the, with the dancing. And I would say like that all just came in and made it so powerful. I would love for this piece uh, to tour nationally, to tour to all these large cities, especially where there's a large African-American population, and to get into the schools just like we did here. And, but also, the show is also built for these students, but also their families. It's really, really important, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, auntie, uncle, see the show, because what I would love to happen is everybody goes home that night and then they talk about it. That's the point, right? The mission of this project is to create conversation around the narrow aspects of the black identity and then how that relates to economic development in the black community. This is living proof that you could literally do whatever you want to do. And even though you may get hit, you may get hurt, you may get brung down a little, you'll still be you and be able to go forward to whatever you're trying to achieve. Today was the first performance where, I mean, I could see the audience a little bit, but it felt like 80 to 90% of the audience was the exact target audience this show is for. And it, it gave me a sense of like, this is why we did this. This is a story of a big idea that actually didn't get derailed by the pandemic. In March, the New Albany Symphony Orchestra held a world premiere with live streaming and limited in-person seating. The work was by Ohio composer and Guggenheim fellow Adam Roberts. But there was one big surprise. Listen as soloist Cameron Leach says he had to learn to reconnect with the energy of live performance. Largely, my, my career was on hold. I started off the pandemic doing a lot of virtual concerts for two months. And right around May 2020, I, I realized that it was just so much logistical work to record everything in my basement. Uh, I invested in a lot of new gear, but I, I essentially decided to press pause on my solo career. So that's why this gig means so much to me. We are in rehearsal for our uh, concert with uh, Cameron Leach, our percussion soloist, um, featuring a new commission by Adam Roberts. I think 
the biggest challenge for all arts organizations uh, in Ohio has just been the constant changing. Um, you know, the protocols keep changing every single day. There's something different. So, um, you know, something that takes a year to to plan, like a concert, um, we are having to, uh, you know, flip a switch and really, um, you know, go with whatever is is happening at the moment. Definitely the re rehearsals are shorter in length um, and we have about half the number of musicians on stage. We're all socially distanced, um, six feet apart. We have uh, plexiglass barriers between our winds and brass players. Um, we're doing temperature checks and, and uh, making sure that everyone's healthy um, when they get here. Well, it's been difficult, as, as you know, a lot of the musicians in our industry have, have been uh, not been able to play or make their art. But we've been lucky enough, we had to cancel a concert, so we're very happy to at least be doing this. Some, some orchestras are furloughed and not making anything, and uh, thanks to the board and Heather and everybody, we're, we're alive, so it's good. For me, it was really the project that I was working on during the pandemic, and it was going to be my big premiere once, hopefully, you know, kind of to mark kind of the end of the pandemic in a way, not that we're totally at the end, but a start to making music again like this. So in some ways, for me, it's been probably more seamless than it's been for my um, performer colleagues because my work happens at the desk anyway at home so but it has been anxious in the sense of you know I invested a lot of energy and time into writing this pretty big piece for example and I didn't know of course for sure if it would happen so wondering if it would be possible or if we'd have to postpone it a year or years <laughs> One thing I realized at the first rehearsal for this new concerto, um, it was really a workshopping experience with, with the ensemble and with Luis and, and with everybody involved, but I didn't feel any emotion on stage, good or bad. And what I came to realize is that I largely sort of separated myself from music throughout the pandemic, mentally, you know, and personally. And so being back on the stage, I'm actually relearning how to appreciate what it is I do. I think maybe we've all been slightly traumatized by the pandemic, like we're all going to be at home forever. Um, so to, to have this be a way that we can come out of the house and start to make music together again, it, this piece will forever mean this to me. The New Albany Symphony will be performing a series of concerts at Rose Run Park this summer. Some are ticketed, but many are free to the public. Log on to NewAlbanySymphony.com for more information. When we think of buttery three-part harmonies and an old-school band that knows how to strum a sultry guitar riff, you know we're talking about the Salty Caramels. Here's one of Columbus's favorite bands in a Broad and High Presents session with their original song, Safe. Buckle your seatbelt, here comes 
some turbulence. Passenger, can you deal with disaster? Cause you're the one near the entrance. Take me to my destination, but please. That's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org, as well as on our YouTube channel. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. I am E.J. Jones, and I am the man who knits. I only knit with natural fibers, probably cashmere and camel hair, and wool are my favorite. I look, I look everywhere for, for yarn. When I go to the Salvation Army, I am looking for the largest sweater that has the most designer characters to it that 
is cashmere. Well, here's one. It's got a big hole in it, but uh, I can use that. I could not afford yarn that I'm used to knitting with for sweaters. They were very, the yarn's very expensive, and I found that if you buy a sweater and you take it apart, you've got, for the most part, pretty good yarn to work with. I learned how to knit hats from a sweater that I had finished and had extra yarn. So I knitted a hat. I am going to put it on to see what I, if you like it or not. What do you think? All made from recycled sweaters. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you.